easy to get through. The last one was not so easy to get through, so I hope you'll go to it. You can see all of our messages there. And, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, I don't know where all we are, but uh, we're out there. Oh. Um, but the website's really cool, Brian and Alexis, Corey, and Slater have been working on it. Um, looks really good, so I appreciate them taking care of that. But, but I did think this week as I was praying, uh, you know, you, you do a message called Greater Than and talk about how great God is. How do you really stop at one? You know, it's kind of like that's really should be the message every week. God's greater than anything we could ever imagine. And I think what we do is, as people, we think about God and, and we hear this. We hear that we're, we're created in God's image and that, that's true. We know that that's true. And I think what we do is we, we look at and we think about God and we, we look at people and, you know, look at Daryl and look at Mike and, and uh, you know, Justin. And we kind of go, you know, God's kind of like us, but he's just a little bit better. And that's just not true. God is so much bigger and greater than we could ever imagine. And all you have to do is go out at night. If you, if we ever have any clear nights, which we hadn't had many lately, but if we ever have a clear night, you can go out at night and look up at the stars and just look, and it's just stunning. It's just amazing to me. And I, I love, I love things with space. I talked about things like that last week, and some of you are hoping I won't do that this week. But uh, it's just too bad I'm going to anyway. I love that kind of stuff, man. I'm just, I, I love, I, I, I do things like I get on YouTube and I look back at the old space shuttle launches and I crank up the volume as loud as I can. It's like that stuff just fascinates me, you know. And uh, I talked about us going to Disney and riding mission space and I want to I want to get in a rocket and take off you know I don't care about going to space or going to the moon I just want to take off and then come back down I think that would be so awesome but and and Donnie bought me a book of the universe from the Hubble telescope you go on the Hubble space uh, telescope website and look at the pictures that that thing takes of the universe it's just stunning it's amazing and to think that, you know, it's all about us is just kind of crazy. When you think of how, how big the universe is, and I even talked about that last week, so I'm not going to repeat my whole sermon, but the whole point is that we have to right-size God. We really have to get a perspective of how big God is. And when we do that, it can help us actually make more sense of our life and the way our life is. So today I want to talk to you about... How, how great God really is. When Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Man, we live in the greatest place. I think we live in the greatest place in the world, honestly, right here. Uh, and we live in the greatest nation in the world, of course. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's true. With all this stuff, man, I still think we live in the greatest nation in the world. You know, and I was, I don't know what it was that we were watching. I think we were watching, uh, Donna was sleeping, and I was watching the race yesterday. And uh, for you, you guys that have insomnia, turn on the NASCAR race, and you'll go right to sleep. It's just awesome. But I was watching it, and they have always have a, a, a you know military at the races, and they had commercials for recruiting military. And I just thought, man, thank God for our military that they they allow us in this country to have all the freedom we have. You know, there's a lot of countries you can't gather like this. You, you can't gather in a church like this and 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 speak what you believe is the truth in freedom. And so we we have that freedom. And we live in a great place, but all you got to do is just drive a little bit north, go up on Burnt Mountain, and just look at the scene. It's stunning. It's awesome, you know. And 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 we're not too far from from the ocean. You can go to the ocean and and just look at nature, man. And it's hard to imagine that there's not a God. Psalm chapter 19, verse 1 through 6 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. Last week I talked about, you know, the, the size of our galaxy. You know, when you think about uh, God spoke, Scripture tells us that God spoke the world into existence. He spoke light and light came out because when God asked for something, it happens. And God spoke light and light came out of the mouth of God at 186,000 miles per second. 
And then we talked about how far light travels in a year. We have a, the, the distance we have to measure in space is light years. You can't use a foot or a mile. You have to use light years, the distance that light travels in a year's time, which is 5.88 trillion miles in a year that light travels. And you look at our solar system. The Milky Way galaxy that is 100,000 light years across from one side to the other. That if you took off at 186,000 miles a second, it would take you 100,000 years to go from one side to the other. And that's just our neighborhood. That's just where we live. In 1977, NASA launched the Voyager 1. I think I said Voyager 2 in the first service. The Voyager 1, and, and it was... It was uh, 3.7 billion miles away from Earth heading out into space at 40,000 miles an hour. And NASA sent a message to the Voyager 1 and said, before you get too far, we want you to turn around and take a picture of the solar system. And so it started taking pictures, 60 pictures. Because you can't just take a wide panoramic shot. I mean, my iPhone is pretty awesome, but it won't take a shot like that. And it took five and a half hours for each pixel to make it back from the Voyager 1. It took a month to get the picture. And when we got the picture back in 1990, this is what it looked like. And the little rays of light are actually beams from the sun. And that, to, I know, that's, to me that's awesome. But y'all remember, we used to have to go to the photo mat. When we were kids, we had a photo mat down from our house. And you go to the photo mat, and y'all, how many of you remember a photo mat? And you go down there and you get your pictures developed, and, and that's the kind of picture you throw away. You'd say, I don't want that picture, right? Had my finger over the lens or whatever. But that's a stunning picture. But in one of those beams of light is what they called the pale blue dot. I don't want anybody to miss it. That's the earth. From 3.7 billion miles away. In our solar system. And one of the astronomers at NASA said, every person that's ever lived a life has lived on that pale blue dot. Stunning. And then we think, man, it's all about me. And we see a picture like that, and it, and it makes me feel really, really small. And, and, I mean, my goal this morning is not to, to make you feel small. My goal is to make us realize that we are small. In view of God, in, in view of the, the Creator that could speak all this into existence... We are really, really small. But that should bring us a lot of hope and a lot of encouragement to know that the God that can speak something into existence like that cares about you and me and knows each of us by name. What an amazing God. He truly is. The scripture even says that, that God put all the stars into the universe and knows each of them by name. I said last week, we, you know, NASA has all these long names for stars called NGC this or that and whatever. And God says, no, that's Fred. You, you call him that, but he's Fred to me or whatever. God is an amazing God. Acts 17 verse 24 says, from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Why God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. It's just kind of crazy to think that it's an accident. That all of this could just happen. Oh, there's a design and there's a designer. There's a creator because there's a creation. You know, the, the, this building is here, and we, and we look at this building, and we go, you know, there's a building here, so there must have been a builder. Each one of you are alive and have purpose because God created you and has a plan for you. To think it's just an accident just doesn't make sense to us. Well, we know the story, Genesis 2, I won't read all of it, but we, we know that the scripture tells us that, that God created man and he placed him, it says he placed the man whom he had formed in the Garden of Eden. 
God caused every tree to grow up. It says that the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cult cultivate it and keep it. See, we have this, this false teaching, I think, that says that everything was great and that man didn't have anything to do until the fall. That was not true. The scripture tells us clearly in verse 15 that God put man there to work. From the very beginning, we had work to do. It wasn't like what we have to do now, but, but God gave man work to do. He told him, you can eat from every tree you want, except for this one tree. There was one rule. One rule. You know, all the stupid laws in the world and in the land come because somebody did something stupid, right? I used to ride motorcycles and we, you know, motorcyclists love stickers and we put helmet uh, stickers on our helmet. And I had a, one that looked like a Band-Aid that said, stupid hurts. Stupid does hurt. And stupid hurt mankind. But it said all there was was one rule, one tree. You could do whatever you want on this one tree but eat the fruit. I don't, we don't know that it was an apple, but it was something. Then, man, then God created woman. It says in verse 23, the man said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. We know the scriptures from all the weddings we go to. This reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The part I love, it says, The man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. Food must have not had any calories back in those days. It'll take a little while. It'll kind of filter around. Y'all y'all get it back in there. But there was no shame. There was no pain. There was it, was, it was awesome. No regret. No trials. No death. Nothing, but it was awesome. Of course, then we know that the serpent came along and tempted Eve and tried to trick her and said, did God really say that you would die? And she said this, that God, God said that you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. And the first manipulation of God's word came along when Eve said you should not touch it. God never said they couldn't touch it. God said, just don't eat from the fruit. They could have climbed the tree. I think they could have built a tree house in the tree. They could have done whatever they want as long as they just didn't eat the fruit. She got tempted. It says that the woman saw that the food was good. And she gave some to her husband. I want to say something to you men. When you look in the scripture, it appears that God spoke to the man before the woman was ever there. And told him, don't eat of this. Now, we, we assume that, that Adam told her that, but maybe he didn't tell her everything. But it was his responsibility to protect his home, and he didn't do it. And then it says, both their eyes were open, they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings, themselves loin coverings. Man, this is just like us. We screw stuff up, and then we try to fix it. We're the one that makes the mistakes and we think, you know, I messed up, so I've got to fix it. I've got to, I got to make this right. And it never works that way. Then the consequences came and it says that she would have great pain in childbirth and then he would rule over her. And then, then the, God said, cursed is the ground because of you and toil you will eat of it. So his work suddenly was much harder than it was before. Then it says that at, in verse 20 that the man called his wife's name Eve. And then it says the Lord God made garments for, of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. What this tells me is the very first sacrifice, the very first death, was so that God could clothe man and woman. The interesting thing is it says that the Lord God made the garments. See, they tried to fix it themselves and they couldn't fix it. How many times have we done that? How many, how many times have I tried to fix stuff that I messed up? And it never, ever works. But when we let God fix the things that we've messed up, it works the way it's supposed to work. This is a great picture of grace in the very beginning. People think that grace is just a New Testament idea. It's not. This was grace from the beginning. They messed up and God made them garments of skin. What an amazing thought that God loved us that much, isn't it? But maybe you're like me and you've asked this question. If God is so great, 
Why is there so much pain? Why is, there, why is there so much suffering in the world? And man, there is, isn't there? Let's just be honest. There's a tremendous amount of pain and suffering. And now, now we've got all kinds of crazy diseases, you know, made up to, from beer names and stuff like that. You know, it's just, it's insane. There's so much garbage and so much just pain and shame and regret and hurt. And, you know, it's just crazy, isn't it? It's terrible. Why is there so much bad stuff going on? If God is so good, anybody ever asked this? I, I'm just being honest with you this morning. If God is so good, why is this going on in my family? If God is so good, why did my father die when I was four years old? If God is so good, if God is so good, why did my mother die when I was 18? After suffering for a year and a half, if God is so good, why was I on my own suddenly at 18 years old? And some of you have gone through worse. Some of you have lost children. I, I can't imagine the pain of losing a child. I don't want to ever experience that. I, I want to go long before my kids. If God is so good, why is all this stuff going on? James chapter 1 verse 2 says, Consider it all joy. My brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But James says that there's, there's something that God can do with all the pain and the trials and all the stuff that you're going through and that you should consider it joy. And that doesn't make sense to us. I understand it. And when I read that, I just go, this doesn't make sense that I should consider joy from all the pain that I've had. James chapter uh, 1 verse, verse 12 in the same chapter says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The Bible tells us that somehow God can even use our pain for our benefit. And see, many of you know that, and I, I know it too, and I understand it up here, but I don't want to go through the pain to get to the point that it helps me. I want to get to the point where I'm better without the pain. And it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, it does sometimes years later, you know. See, I understand now, I, in, to, to a degree, not 100%. You know, my, my wife, my kids have never, never had the, the privilege to know my father or my mother. But it made me who I am. If I could go back, I wouldn't experience that. Twelve years ago when our house burned down and we lost everything we had, I, I don't want to go through that again. But something happened in that. It has made me who I am. The Bible's full of stories where God takes bad things and turns it into good. The story of Joseph. You, you probably heard the story of Joseph in Genesis chapter 50. It says, as for you meant, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. I don't know anybody in Scripture that was more mistreated than Joseph. Not knowing what was going to happen, I told a story this morning in the first service that I have a brother and a sister that used to beat the crap out of me, but they never sold me as a slave. They were really abusive to me, though. Just saying. That's right. Amen, sister. You tell it. But they never sold me as a slave. Joseph was mistreated, but he somehow, he had the right perspective that God can use this for good. Isaiah 61.3 said to console those who mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy, joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. See, this is what we talked about last week. Everything that God does is for his glory. It's for his recognition so that he would be glorified and that people would come to know him. The scripture from Acts chapter 17 when we, we talked about how God has placed us in certain places at certain times. God has you here at this moment and he places you geographically where he has you in this time in history so that you might reach out and find him. God knows exactly the circumstances we need to be in to possibly find him. 
And I know that the things that I went through when I was almost homeless at a time, all of those things God used so I could find him. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 says, For it is God who works is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You ever notice older people how it seems like they never get real upset about things no matter what's going on in their lives. It seems like they just roll right along with the punches and it, it never seems to bother them. Isn't that amazing how that happens? And we just think, man, these people are so smart or they're so strong. No, what they've learned is that God is always faithful. And that he, he can take all those bad things and use them for your good. But it will always be for his glory and for his pleasure. It's not about us. It's for him. And it's about him. First Peter 1 says, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God is greater than anything going on in your life right now, whether good or bad. And he's greater than anything that's ever happened in your life, whether good or bad. And he plans to use it to turn you in the person that he wants you to be. Not that you'd be some weirdo religious fanatic, but that you would just love him and give him the glory and the honor for what he's doing. See, I think too many times in the church we, we, do, we just turn into these weirdos and, and people, people can't relate to us. We need to understand that we're not perfect and we never will be. I'm still a work in process, man. i got a long way to go. A long way. But God's still working on me. Romans 8.28 says, We know that God causes all things... To, but I just want to stop right there. We need to understand God doesn't cause all things. But he does cause all those things to work together. To those who love God and are called according to his purpose. One of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, said this, that, that God whispers in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, shouts in our pain, that it's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. You know, when things are awesome, we don't have ears for God. We just don't. But man, when things are hard, we'll come to church, we'll come to the altar, we'll pray, we might even read our Bibles. We'll do whatever it takes to get out of that hard time. God uses all of those things. kind of like making a cake you know when you make a cake you got to have the ingredients to make a cake but I don't know many people that would take a stick of butter and just chunk it in their mouth and start chewing on it well there's some of you freaks that might but but most people would not take a stick of butter and just start chewing on it. that's pretty nasty right or take a handful of flour and just it's awful it's nasty or maybe an egg, crack an egg and swallow it. Mike does all the time, but most normal people wouldn't do that. I mean, the sugar's good. You know, the sugar and the milk, that, that's good. But see, when you put all that stuff together, you get an awesome cake. Chocolate. Amen. 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 If you're new here today, if this is your first time at Living Word Church, we're going to take, let you take a piece of this cake home. But see, that's what God does. God takes all this stuff, all the bad, all the stuff that you would never want on its own. And he takes the good with it. And he mixes it all up and turns it into something beautiful, something awesome. See, I don't, want you to, I don't want you to ever see cake the same again. Because see, anything, anything that would cause me to find God is a huge blessing. 
anything. I have children that are far from the Lord. And I don't want anything bad to happen to them. Doug, I just don't. And there have been bad things that have happened to them. And there's been times when Don and I thought, maybe this is the thing. Maybe this is it that's going to that's gonna bring them back to him, you know? But see, God's going to take all of that good stuff and all that bad stuff and turn it into something awesome. Because God's greater than cake. He's greater than anything. And I don't know where you are today. Maybe you're in a place where you're in a bad place. And you don't know what's going to happen next. I want to give you a few minutes to spend some time with him. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to do another song. Our prayer team is available. I'm going to ask some of our prayer team members if they'd come up front just on the sides. If, if you want somebody to pray with, you can go pray with them. It'll just be between you and them. Maybe you want to come to the altar. Or maybe you just want to stay right where you are. It doesn't matter. But God is here. And he loves you. And he knows about all the bad stuff. He knows about the good stuff. And I promise you that he is faithful. And he's taken all of that stuff. And he's turning it into something awesome. If you will let him, he will do it. Father, I ask you at this moment to do what only you can do. To speak so clearly. To let us know, God, those that are struggling today those that are hurting desperately in their heart, those that have been rejected and lied about, cheated, those that have made mistakes on their own and sinned on their own, God, let them know that you haven't left them. You are here for them. And you will take all of those things, the good and the bad, and turn them into something awesome if they will just come to you in truthfulness, in authenticity, and allow you to do what you want to do today your name.